so just to kind of caricature or cartoon um, what the hypothesis or concern might be, um, showing these sort of interaction chain and the size of the picture is sort of an indication of the relative numbers within the community. Um, small amount of groupers um, outside a reserve allows um, more herbivores and that grazes down seaweed more and that allows coral to compete better. So the concern is something like that could turn into something like this in a marine reserve where you have a lot of predators and they're depressing herbivorous pit parrotfish. That's allowing seaweed to bloom and that's uh, overgrowing or otherwise impacting corals. So um, I'm just going to jump to some of the qualitative results um, and much of this has been published already. The short story is that that doesn't happen overall. And that's because all parrotfish aren't created equal. While small parrotfish, like this striped parrotfish, are subject to um, increased predation by increased uh, populations of parrotfish, other parrotfish get bigger and can't fit in grouper mouths, essentially. At least that's, that's what the data appears to suggest, is that there's a size refuge that um, bigger species of parrotfish can grow to escape. And if one does the math and sums up the overall um, amount of grazing potential by species and size class um, inside the reserve versus outside the reserve, one sees that in the park there's essentially a doubling of grazing intensity or predicted grazing intensity or estimated, I guess. Um, and similarly, there's a fourfold decrease in um, seaweed cover. And related to this, then, is this positive correlation then between grazing and coral recruitment density. So as grazing increases, seaweed decreases, that frees up space for corals to recruit and we see that effect. The red, the red spots are basically the sites within the park compared to sites outside the park. So the park has great, higher coral recruitment. And when, we, when uh, Alistair Harborn and Peter Mumby resampled in the park three years later, um, they also saw an increase in coral growth then in the park relative to outside the park. And again, this, this showed a negative correlation with the amount of seaweed. So in sites that had lower seaweed cover and those were the parks inside the park still, or, um, there was, there was an increased coral growth. So going back to this um, sort of hypothesis again, it sort of um, appears that it's a straw man scenario. And what we're really more likely to be seeing is outside the park, there's few predators and few herbivores, more algae and less corals. And inside the park, we have more both predators and herbivores, less seaweed and more potential for coral recovery. And I realized the one thing I didn't tell you uh, to explain why this happens, why you see that there's actually more grazing inside the park despite um, predation in the park is that uh, parrotfish are also caught outside the park. So they're not a targeted species. The grouper are being targeted by fish traps. But as Sheila showed about Bermuda, parrotfish um, are very susceptible to traps. You know, they're very, they go into traps, they get caught, and once they're caught, they're not released. They're used as grouper bait. So they're terminal. Um, uh, terminal. So just to sum up then, um, there's positive feedbacks in this system. Um, more parrotfish grazing leads to decreased seaweed. That leads to increased coral. Increased, um, that additional structure is thought to add uh, habitat um, for increased fish recruitment. And um, this is a positive feedback that sort of accumulates over time and thereby adds um, resilience to the overall system. So we have both a win-win here of a sort. We have a valuable species economically, the grouper benefiting from marine reserves and key ecological processes, particularly grazing and coral recruitment that um, increase the resilience of this system to global impacts as well as local impacts as other people have um, suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Our next talk is by Roy Lowe, and Roy's going to be talking to us about seabirds in Oregon. If I can just drive this.
Thank you. Today I'm going to talk about a small coastal headland that uh, was co-managed by uh, two agencies where we saw a big increase in human use and as well we documented a, in a large increase in nesting seabirds. So uh, Uquinta Head is a small 42-acre coastal headland located about three kilometers north of Newport on the Oregon coast. In 1980, the Bureau of Land Management acquired the headland and is, it is managed as the Uquinta Head Outstanding Natural Area. And the rocks surrounding the headland are part of Oregon Island's National Wildlife Refuge, and the rocks there were put into the refuge in 1968 and 1982. Both of these agencies are within the U.S. Department of Interior. In 1873, a lighthouse was built on the headland, and as you can see, it was a pretty heavy footprint on the headland with the structures and the road. And in addition, uh, livestock roamed the headland, so there were likely very few birds present here during this period. By 1973, there, you can see there is a seabird population uh, growing on Colony Rock. Uh, the lighthouse has been automated, and um, there's no one living there, uh, but the, the public is allowed to roam anywhere on that headland as long as you didn't climb over the fence. And although you can't see it well on this slide here, there are trails all over that headland, uh, so birds were not nesting on the, on the mainland. This was also the local party spot where it wasn't uncommon for people to pull up and take shotguns and six packs of beer out of their car and shoot birds fa uh, passing by. So it was a little bit draconian in the beginning, just trying to get people out of certain areas, and so we posted signs on some of the rock access to our refuge, uh, just trying to keep people out of these areas. Uh, BLM did likewise, posting signs, putting up fences, and so forth. Now, environmental education and interpretation is a big part of our success story, but in the early days, it was out of control. This is a 1987 photograph, the first year that BLM had a full-time employee on the headland, and she called one day and said, help. And we drove out there and counted 27 buses, vans, all sorts of vehicles, disgorging their uh, load of children and teachers and parents down into the intertidal zone where they were literally trampling the sea life that they came to study. And the rock in the background is one of our refuge rocks, and there's very few birds present, and all the harbor seals that traditionally haul out there are gone. Now you jump forward six years, and the uh, educational effort has been spread out over the entire spring. Uh, buses are scheduled, and they're met by interpreters from BLM. And this is that same rock in the background, and you can see the harbor seals are, are back home and fat and happy. Uh, the headland uh, at the time of acquisition had two active rock quarries on it, and both were shut down. The lower one was converted to an intertidal area, and the upper one serves as the administrative site for BLM uh, for their various buildings and visitor center. They have uh, paved the road out to the site, and there's various interpretive features developed on the headland. Chief among those are interpretive panels that explain the natural history of the various resources out there and the need for their conservation. There's wildlife viewing decks built right on the edge of the, uh, of the headland there, and they, they look right into some really magnificent seabird colonies. So uh, we, we get a lot of good, uh, good observations done from the deck. And while BLM has been busy trying to protect resources elsewhere along the headland, we have uh, recruited and um, stationed volunteers uh, at this overlook of the seabird colony where they make thousands upon thousands of one-on-one -on -one contacts with the public. Two of the species we have the best data for uh, that have shown increases are the Brant's cormorant and common MERS, and both of these seabirds, unlike tropical seabirds, are very uh, sensitive to disturbance and will flee at the close approach of humans. This shows you the public use data. In 1981, about 125,000 people visiting the headland, and uh, literally about a decade later, where we've tripled the number of people present, all the way up to over a half million of visitors in 1996. And then you see there was a drop in 1999, and that was primarily due to a, a fee being imposed to, to get into the site. And then there was another little blip in 2006 uh, where the lighthouse was closed, and so were the seabird viewing decks. But we see, uh, an, again, a, an increasing trend of human use uh, following the fee initiation. And this is uh, the results uh, of the Brant's cormorants. In 1979, about 170 birds there. And uh, also in about a decade, a 2 to 300 percent increase, all the way up to uh, over 2,000 percent increase in 1996. And then you see our numbers have kind of cycled. And we think this is a natural pattern that we'll see into the future because Brant's cormorants tend to move their colony sites around to lower uh, nest site parasites. Uh, so we expect to see, uh, see this in the future. And even if you look at the low years, we're still 2 to 300 percent greater than, than historically. And in addition to increased numbers of birds on the headland, 
uh, we went from one colony site to 13 colony sites, and note that some of those were on the headland, and, and note the whitewash. We've got lots of birds now using the headland where people were roaming uh, not long ago. Common MERS saw an immediate increase from about 5,000 birds into the 20, 30,000 range, and then in 1999 it really took off to the point that we're now around 90,000 common MERS breeding there. Uh, so a really significant increase in this bird that really is sensitive to human disturbance. And we went from one colony site to the three colony sites. And again, one of these is on the mainland. Uh, so today you can stand on the deck and you look out at Flat Talk Rock, and there are more common MERS in this photograph than nest in the entire state of Washington or in the providence of British Columbia. <clears throat> and when you span, you, you just span over to the right, and you can see par portions of colony rock, a less than two acre rock, with tens of thousands of common MERS getting ready to come ashore at the beginning of the breeding season. This is one of the densest seabird colonies I've seen either in person or in photographs, and it's a really an amazing sight. Uh, flat top rock, it's only 68 meters from the deck to the rock. From this point, it's about 80 meters. That's really close for, for these seabirds. And although I didn't present data today, other species that saw benefits of, uh, of changing humans' use there in environmental education interpretation are plagic cormorants, which expanded greatly around the headland, pigeon guillemots nesting in very close proximity to, to people, and black oyster catcher, another very sensitive species. There are five pairs at Yukuna Head, which is a pretty good diverse, uh, de density for this species. <clears throat> so today, Yukuna Head serves as one of the premier seabird viewing uh, places in the United States. And you can go there on any day where there's a, it's fair weather and the parking lot will be full. And um, it contributes greatly to the local economy through ecotourism. And I would like to thank the Bureau of Land Management, particularly Kathy Liska and Michael Nowak, during the early days of changing some difficult human behavior. And I'd also like to thank today's sponsors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roy. I'd now like to ask Brian Tissota to come to the podium. Brian's going to talk to us about community-based management in Hawaii. So aloha and good afternoon. Uh, I had the privilege of telling you about a project I've been involved with the last 15 years and representing a large group of people because that's what it took to get this done as in most of these cases. Uh, we call ourselves the West Hawaii Aquarium Project or WAP because we wanted to make a difference. And West Hawaii is the west coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, the main, main people that have been involved in this that aren't here, Bill Walsh is definitely the number one person this project been involved for about 20 years. Sarah Peck with the Hawaii Sea Grant, the West Hawaii Fishery Council, which I'll talk to you about, is a de dedicated group of volunteers which have been involved in co-management of this system, all volunteering on their time. Uh, Ivor Williams as well, a lot of divers, mostly undergraduate divers trained by the University of Hawaii, and a whole host of other people, as well as all the people that supported this research. So essentially what our project is about is to balance different uses of reef fish in Hawaii. This was not really a project about sustainability, although it turned into one. And really we were trying to focus on conflicts around primarily this fish, the yellow tang. And it's kind of a, a proxy for fish in general, but this is harvested live by the aquarium fishery in Hawaii and represents about 80% of the catch. And so people use this fish in different ways. The community looked at it. There's a big dive tourism industry built around this and other fish. And there is a large live caught aquarium fishery that uses it as well. So our challenge was to, to balance that because there were conflicts. And the way we did that was by engaging a diverse group of people, trying to get everybody that was involved in this, first in education, then in co-management, and also in cooperative research, and doing that both with natural and social science. What we actually accomplished, which I'll tell you up front, is, is quite remarkable. We managed to replenish these fish and others in marine protected areas, which were established during the project. Uh, I think I can demonstrate that we've shown spillover of adult fish outside of MPAs to um, areas where they can be fished, uh, larval connectivity among populations within and outside of MPAs, uh, what we think is a, one of the few sustainable ornamental trades in the world. 
and we have reduced conflict among stakeholders. So first let me tell you how this started. This started by a conflict, and the conflict lasted for decades because the state really did not want to deal with it. And this is an article that I think summarizes it. You know, the, the truth that really it almost turned out to a shootout on the beach is not too far from reality. This was a very heated conflict. There were lots of things happening, and it escalated to the point where um, it, was, it was fairly bad. So what happened was the Keener community became engaged in this as an issue, and, and reef management in general. And I think if there's anything I've seen today, none of these problems are solved easily. It takes decades of work by a lot of dedicated people, and certainly this is no exception. Uh, it began early by having workshops on education around issues, not just aquarium fish, but other things. Uh, they tried to make informal agreements with fishermen and dive tour operators to sort that out. When that didn't work, they established, established a small set of marine protected areas when that didn't work, eventually the nonprofit group, the Lost Fish Coalition, uh, came up with tried to ban collecting on the coast, but then eventually ended up working quite well to improve management. During this process, we established volunteer monitoring programs in West Hawaii, uh, worked with children in K-12 to get volunteer groups, also a monitoring program, and all of this really developed a lot of momentum and support for what eventually happened, which was led up legislative action in 1998, uh, which became what's known as Act 306. Act 306 was a very creative piece of legislation that essentially created the West Hawaii Regional Fishing, Fishery Management Area. The entire west coast of the Big Island was an area where we could have flexible management strategies that would give some um, community a say in how things were done, with three major mandates and a bunch of other ones which I won't have time to talk about. One of those was to designate at least 30% of areas as marine protected areas that ban aquarium fish collecting, not fishing, just aquarium fish collecting. Also that the community would be substantively involved in these decisions and co-management and that there would be an assessment of the efficiency of these networks. To do that, we created two groups, one of which was WAP, which is most of what I'm going to talk about today, but an also extremely important group, the West Hawaii Fishery Council, which was, a, again, a stakeholder group designed to help um, co-manage the fishery with the state. So initially, the, the West Hawaii Fishery Council, which included aquarium collectors, regular fishermen, uh, community members, dive tour operators, as well as 40% as of the group was native Hawaiians from different regions, basically came together with initial goal of where to put the marine protected areas. So again, large of this was conflict, so they're trying to figure out where to put these so there would not be conflict between these two groups. And so in addition to helping establish a marine protected area network, it also helped reduce conflict among these groups. Uh, later next year, there was a, a public meeting about this. A thousand people attended one of the largest meetings in Hawaii ever for a natural resource issue, and 93% of the people supported it, which is pretty unique if you've been to MPA meetings. Um, later that year, yeah, it's usually 93% the other way, um, they, they, they did propose and the governor did sign off on nine marine protected areas which are up and down the west coast of the Big Island, uh, collectively closing 35% of the coastline to marine aquarium collecting. Uh, we didn't know anything about the life history of these species or habitat. These were just kind of spaced out and again, largely trying to separate the conflict. What we did then was establish a monitoring program. So we didn't really know how to design these things, but we studied them very intensely and, and learned. And so this was a cooperative program, again, with a lot of people, a lot of divers, a lot of time. The University of Hawaii program Quest was used as a platform to train primarily undergraduates, but some graduate students to do the work. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years now. We selected 23 study sites that included areas that were still open, these new marine protected areas and places that have been closed for over 10 years and counted fish, and this is still going on. We also do reef surveys, but the primary focus is on aquarium fish. So what have we found? Well, after 10 years of data, we have successfully replenished the primary fish, the yellow tang. Here's the density of fish over time. We had one year of baseline before they were closed, and you can get an idea of the density there. Um, as we see, within three years, marine protected areas increased these stocks, and after five years, they would increase to 71%, or 72% relative to before. Uh, we also have control areas we compare these to, as well as open areas. These areas are actually doing better than the, the long-term control areas that were closed prior to these. The open areas are also fairly stable. 
Um, there are other aquarium fish that are increasing as well, one at least that is significant. So, but generally, again, this is 80% of the fishery, so this is really what we're trying to strive for. In addition to this, uh, we've also demonstrated that these MPAs actually work, as a lot of people talk about. Kind of the, as we know, the holy grail of marine protected areas is spillover and seeding versus connectivity. Uh, Ivor Williams and Bill Walsh showed that, if you, you know, the idea that if you have a marine protected area, that builds up in biomass, you get spillover to other areas. In a recent paper, uh, we presented some data which shows that the density of adult yellow tangs within marine protected areas is fairly high, and within a roughly half of a kilometer or so from those areas, you do see an, an increase in density relative to areas further away where there's lots of fishing. So we think spillover is happening there. We've also uh, demonstrated in a recent manuscript by uh, Mark Christie and o Mark Hickson at Oregon State University, uh, connectivity, using a unique genetic method, being able to actually connect adult yellow tangs to new recruits, and we've seen adults that are connected both here and here, as well as between here and here, showing that larval fish are moving from both within MPAs to areas outside and from outside areas into MPAs. So there is also connectivity and seeding within this network. And finally, we've also seen that the fishery has actually improved after the establishment of marine protected areas. When they were established in the year 2000, even though it declined initially, they have increased and it's the best harvest that's ever had. It also has attracted larger numbers of fishermen, and the catch per unit effort appears to be fairly stable. And in addition to that, a survey conducted by Todd Stevenson of veteran collectors that have been there for the entire period of time the marine protected area network was established have shown that um, the socioeconomic status of them has largely improved for the most part. For after the establishment of marine protected areas, they're actually doing better. And although conflict still does exist, it actually seems to improve overall relative to uh, beforehand. So really, the secrets of getting all this done, to me, were, were really two major things. One was engaging both the community and the legislature. You really need both bottom-up and top-down to get it done, and that was, was key. Also, having both strong natural science, so we actually study this and feed that back to the community and so that they learn. And there's actually support now for an MPA network for fishing, and we hope that that'll be the next step. Um, to learn more about the project, go to the Hawaii Coral Reef Network. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Spectacular exit. Um, <laughs> just our last, uh, second last speaker is going to be Billy Causey. You're not going to push me off, are you? Yeah. <laughs> I hope you can speak without slides, Billy, because it looks like... No, oh, here we go. That's not right. There it is. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, John, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Nancy, Jeremy, thank you very much for making this possible. It's a great afternoon, great day. It's, it's a wonderful thing to celebrate. We all know that there are some major threats to coral reefs, but I'm going to be really focusing on the last one, overfishing, although I will make some comments about climate change. It's clear that fishing's not like it used to be. And in fact, in my lifetime, I can remember standing with my family beside racks of fish like this and, and celebrating our catch. But in my lifetime, I've seen it change. And what's making this change, the drivers are very clear. But we're seeing a great deal of pressure on the reef fish, uh, particularly in southeast Florida. 73% uh, of the fish are landed by recreational fishing activities, 27% by commercial. Uh, another example of what's happening with growth is that as you see the population growth over to the right increase, so are the number of registered recreational fishing vessels. But look at the line along the bottom and you see the commercial vessels have remained pretty much level over the years. It's, recreational fishing is very important to the Florida Keys and Southeast Florida. Over 20% of the 4 million visitors to the Keys go recreationally fishing. 
It's the second most uh, popular tourist activity. Commercial fishing is the second largest industry beside, behind tourism in the Keys, and our fishermen land between 50 and 70 million dollars worth of seafood product every year. Uh, the lobster over the years, the spiny lobster is the number one uh, seafood pro product landed in the Keys. But it's been some of the devastating fishing activities, such as wire fish traps that came into the Keys and just two years ago were finally prohibited in, in Gulf waters. Red is not good. In fact, that line, over 80% of the fish listed here are overfished. That red line is the line at which they have to be at. To, it's the spawning potential ratio before, in fact, they can be sustainable. So you can see so many of our fish are below that level. But this is where the success story starts. In 1997, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary uh, designated and implemented this nation's first comprehensive marine zoning plan. Five different types of zones were implemented at that time. Three of them are no-take areas. But Two of them are what I really want to focus on, or one, one type of zone, and that's the ecological reserves. These, we have two of them currently in the Florida Keys Sanctuary. One is nine square nautical miles in size, and one is 151 square nautical miles. These are areas of high habitat species diversity. There are areas uh, in some of the best remaining water quality. Uh, there are areas with natural spawning aggregation sites, nursery areas, and so on. It's the full range of habitats in the Keys. In National Marine Sanctuaries, we do, not implement, we do not designate ecological reserves for fisheries management purposes. We put them in place to protect the biodiversity, the habitat, the food, everything that's important for both commercial and recreational species. The nine square nautical mile uh, Western Sambo Reserve is located near Key West. It runs from onshore, offshore. It includes all the major habitats from the onshore, offshore, including patch reefs, sea grasses, and offshore reefs. The Tortugas Reserve is broken up into two components, the, the darker hashed areas to the north. Tortugas North is 91 square nautical miles. Tortugas South is 60 square nautical miles. And now we've added that area inside of the Tortugas National Park, which is a research natural area that provides the shallow habitats that adjoin the deeper habitats in the Florida Keys Sanctuary. As the currents, the, these areas were not accidentally put in place. But as the Florida current moves between us and, and Cuba, a series of counterclockwise gyres spin off. The one in the Tortugas stands for months at a time, as does the Portalis gyre. Those just act like large washing machines, and they actually take anything that's spawned in those areas, any, any eggs and larvae, and, and move them up the reef track. So you can see each of the reserves are strate strategically located around those gyres. I say, I don't want to be caught cutting, talking out of both sides of my mouth. We, we, we establish these not for fisheries management purposes, but our greatest success has come from fisheries activities. They are magnets, not only for creatures, but they're magnets for good scientists who do good science. So the state has uh, been doing a lot of work with spiny lobster. Carolyn Cox, uh, John Hunt, Rod Burleson have been working in the nine square nautical mile uh, western Sambo Reserve as well as the Tortugas. Uh, what we can see with lobster, they started in 97, right when we implemented them, and you can see inside the reserve, we had a hurricane in 98 that kept the levels down, but then you can see that inside the reserve, the number of lobster took off. You can also see that the size of lobster, as well as the number inside the reserve, started increasing rapidly over time. This has also happened with reef fish. Uh, grouper, uh, we saw numbers coming up like this, but then immediately we started seeing some declines right after hurricane seasons in 04 and 05, but now we're starting to see them come back up again. Same thing happened with yellowtail snapper. And in both instances, the catch outside the protected areas have remained somewhat level, whereas in the protected area we've seen a, a great amount of uh, uh, benefit. The Tortugas Reserve has been an area of great study, and in particular, this area right here is a fish spawning aggregation site for uh, grouper and snapper. The Tortugas area provides some deep water coral habitat that adjoins the shallower uh, habitats inside the Dry Tortugas National Park. Jerry Alt and Jim Bonzek have been working in that area for a number of years, and they started actually before the reserve was implemented in 2001. They, they have baseline dives in 99 and 2000, and these all indicate the number of dives they had in that area. You can see in 2000 that the black grouper, these red dots, 
signify the relative density of the black grouper sighted on those dives. And you can see just three years later, after implementing the reserve, there were four times the number of black grouper. Now, this is a real busy chart. Again, red is bad, green's good. You can see here that the numbers are down in the fished areas. But I want you to follow this one right here, mutton snapper. That's plussed up inside the protected areas by 303%. The South, Tortuga South is a fish spawning aggregation site. It's the major spawning aggregation site for the mutton snapper. Another way to look at this is, or let me go back, look at the black grouper. You can see this right here, up 120%. This data is hot off the press, literally. Just crunch, the data was just crunched. Jerry Alt got this to me. But you can see this is what it was like pre-implementation. This is black grouper alone, and we've seen a 64% in size as well as numbers inside the reserve uh, since it was implemented um, eight years ago. We have had a, the, the keys have been in the crosshairs for hurricanes over the last few years in 2004, 2005. We saw that these did have an impact on our fish populations. It's a natural impact, but definitely it's something that we have to think about because this has been going on for centuries and centuries. But right now it even points out the, the fragile nature of our resources as they are today. Another source of science that's been going on in the area has been done by some colleagues in NOAA, um, John Burke and some of his folks from uh, Beaufort Marine Laboratory. And this is the title of some of the work. They've been working out there since the reserve was established in uh, 2004, uh, 2001. And there's been significant changes that have occurred in the reef fish populations. Um, the, these observations um, and the trends provide strong correlation that evidence of the reserve effect is, is working. What's really cool is that the fish are getting larger, they're getting more abundant, and the little fish are disappearing. That's not rocket science. They're eating them. And, and right here, this is really exciting for us to, for, as managers, to, we're seeing the reverse in the decline of commercially and recreationally exploited fish stocks around the Tortugas. I'm going to shift gears to corals a little bit. We've painfully witnessed the decline of corals in the wider Caribbean. That not, has not been a secret. In the Florida Keys, it has torn my heart out to see what has happened over the years, but Clearly, in the bleaching events of 97, 98, we saw a precipitous decline. And then we had a hurricane hit the Keys. The good news is that it hasn't continued on that decline. The bad news is it hasn't popped way back up yet. But we have seen in 06 and 07 some improvement in the corals. We've had two different groups working in the Keys, looking at areas uh, throughout the Keys, hundreds of different sites. The Nature Conservancy has coordinated a group uh, the uh, Florida Reef Resilience Program, and they have been diving different sites. Steve Miller and his group from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, Steve took these photographs right here, have been looking at other habitats. And if you notice, these corals are out competing one another. You hear about the coral decline in the Keys, but you don't hear about some of the areas that are still very healthy. Um, I've seen these photographs around the world. I don't like to show them all the time, but I'm going to show you this last sequence. Over three decades, we have seen enormous decline. We've witnessed it in the Florida Keys. It's nothing to celebrate. It's something that uh, is, is truly has not been a success story. But just five years ago, this is what the reef looked like. In the same location, these photographs were taken in February. So the thing that we can celebrate here, we, we, we can't declare victory by any means. But what we can say is that there are some pockets of corals that are coming back. Um, this is my last slide. I just want to compare what they see on the Great Barrier Reef. This is, this is after recovery of the 2002 coral bleaching events that was so devastating. And the numbers of acropids are so great. So when they're declaring success, in, or at least it's looking better, this is all we can say it's looking better in the, in the Caribbean. We only have two species. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Okay, for the last talk, I'm going to uh, scale up a little bit and talk to you about the Great Barrier Reef.
Hopefully most of you have heard of the Great Barrier Reef. But perhaps some of you aren't quite so sure about where it is or some of the things like its size. Well, that's where it is, down there in Australia, down the other side of the globe. It's on the northeast coast of Australia, abutting the state of Queensland. But a lot of people aren't aware that this is a huge area covering 14 degrees of latitude. And when it was declared in 1975 by the federal government as a marine park, they declared it from low water mark along the coast of Queensland out to 250 kilometres offshore. If we put it next to the west coast of the states, it would effectively stretch from Vancouver down to LA. The name Great Barrier Reef, people often think it's a single reef. It's actually made up of about 3,000 separate reefs of different sizes and shapes. You can see here on this Landsat image, part of the Great Barrier Reef. You'll also notice that the boundary is well outside the reefs, out here in deep water. Within that outer boundary, which as I said goes through to low water mark, we have something like 900 islands. The whole area was declared a World Heritage Area in 1981. Since it was declared in 1975, or, or the Act came into force in 75, it's always been a multiple use marine park. All reasonable uses are allowed to occur in certain zones under certain conditions. So we have trawling, bottom trawling in some areas. We have activities like ports, dredging, defence training, all allowed to occur. This, uh, different activities account for something in the order of $5 billion Australian per annum. That's not a lot against the American dollar, but today this is a huge amount of Australia's economy. Tourism is the major uh, issue or the major factor, but we've also got a very important recreational and commercial fishing industry, huge amount of research and obviously indigenous use for well over 40,000 years. One of the key tools we use for managing this huge area is ocean zoning. And the zoning spectrum is really about uh, extractive activities. As you move from the general use, the least restrictive zone, as you move across to the more restrictive zone, it's obviously um, increasing the amount of, of restriction on use. So if you're going out there in your boat, you can see from this activities matrix that you are basically allowed to use your boat or, or go diving in virtually all zones except the preservation zone. However, if you're a trawler, a bottom trawler, the zoning plan makes it very clear you can only do your activities in the general use zone. This zoning has been introduced progressively uh, since the 80s through to the 90s. And so that's what the map looked like at the end of the or mid 90s. And effectively, uh, we did the best we could with the best available information and the best political will. However, we recognised we weren't doing our job, which was to protect the biodiversity of the Great Barrier Reef. And so today we have a new zoning plan which came into effect in 2004. And effectively, if you look at the comparison here between the old zoning plan and the new zoning plan, you'll see some of the differences in terms of the percentage. The, uh, one of the important ones is the no-take zone, which went from less than 5% of the entire area to one-third of them. That's the green zones we can see spread along the coast. How we did that was a complex process involving community participation, scientific involvement, and obviously some uh, political um, involvement as well. This is the sort of process we went through. It was quite complex. Clearly at the start, the science played a, a very critical role. We used the best available science, and the scientists helped us a lot in producing a map of bioregions, which was a major cornerstone, a series of principles. But we also used the public involvement. We're required by legislation to have at least two phases of public involvement. And so the public gave us advice before the draft plan was prepared, and then they certainly commented on the draft plan and we use that information for the final. I mentioned the map of bioregions. This is just a small part of the Great Barrier Reef, and these bioregions are basically broad-scale habitats to help us determine uh, what's out there, and we wanted to get examples of each bioregion. This is an example of some of the socioeconomic information we used in our planning. We used all available socioeconomic. This is uh, grid square data from one of the commercial fishing activities. And I mentioned the involvement of the public we were required to have two formal phases of public involvement. The first, 10,000 public written submissions, and the second, over 21,000. And you'll see why the importance of this in the next couple of slides. That was the draft plan that we prepared in 2003. As I said, that was based using the best, or developed using the best information. It was based on the bioregions, ensuring we met our planning principles. But when that plan went out, there was quite a bit of controversy, well, that's an understatement, and the 21,000 public submissions we received led to quite a radical change. 
So that's the final, draft, uh, final zoning plan. I just toggle back, you can see some of the changes that occurred between the draft and the final. So 21,000 submissions had a huge amount in the final zoning plan. So some of the outcomes of the rezoning, like we've heard from some of the previous speakers, we've seen a huge increase in coral trout. This is one of the species that both the recreational and the commercial fishers are very interested. So a huge increase in both numbers of fish and size of fish within the areas close to fishing. We've also seen a marked reduction in the crown of thorns starfish in the areas that are close to fishing. Since the rezoning we've done, or well, the scientists have done surveys for us and we've seen things like over 20% of the biomass of the non-reef species now occur in our highly protected areas. And 30% of all the seagrass that we know occurs in the entire area is within the protected areas. I mentioned it was fairly controversial when it came out. Today we've got virtually a huge public acceptance of the zoning. There are still some people who are opposed, they'll always be opposed, but generally the public accepts what we've done. And equally important are the industries that depend on the health of the Great Barrier Reef. They recognise that what we've done in this zoning has made them more sustainable. So what were the factors that led to the success? There were probably four key ones. We did use the best available information, both scientific and social economic. We had a huge amount of public participation and public involvement. We had very effective leadership, both within the agency and at a political level. And as a result, we got the consequent political, social uh, support. But I want to stress, of those four, I think it was really the latter three that were essential. People kept saying to us, we need more science. We didn't need more science, we definitely needed those last three. I also want to stress that ocean zoning is only one of many tools we use to manage the Great Barrier Reef. It's a fundamental tool, but it's not the only tool. And so when our legislation came out, initially, these were the sorts of tools that we talked about, permits, education, surveillance and enforcement. Through adaptive management and learning experience, we recognise that other tools, spatial tools and temporal tools, are also important. And so we've introduced those as we've gone along. You might wonder how we manage such a huge area. Well, it's done in a complementary way between both state and federal agencies. So every day on the water, there's coordination. And so we've got state agencies like Parks and Wildlife, Boating and Fisheries and Water Police. We've got Customs and Coast Watch aircraft who are out there for their own purposes under their own legislation, but they also work and help us uh, carry out enforcement and uh, monitoring of the Great Barrier Reef. So it's very much a coordination role. If I'm asked why we think we've been effective in managing the Great Barrier Reef, it's a whole series of things. I think we've been lucky we've had a good governance and legislative framework. We've certainly taken an ecosystem-based approach to our management, thinking well outside the, the wet bits that we're responsible for. Remember, our jurisdiction only goes to low water, but we are thinking right up to the top of the catchment when we're talking about managing this huge area. We're very lucky that we've got well-integrated um, management with both federal and state agencies, as I just outlined. We're also lucky that we are an iconic area. There is widespread support for the Great Barrier Reef. But also that support is now coming from many of the industries, particularly, say, the tourism. But increasingly, the fishing industry recognises that a healthy Great Barrier Reef means a healthy fishing industry. We're also lucky we work with the research and monitoring agencies and we show them what our priorities are for, for their research. I do want to stress, though, that zoning alone is not going to save the Great Barrier Reef. These are pressures that some of the other speakers have spoken about, and so today we're working on, on these sort of fronts. We're looking at improving water quality, particularly what's coming off the land. We're working very heavily with the fisheries agencies because that's managed by the state of Queensland to ensure more sustainable fisheries. And the really big one is climate change. Again, our, our aim is to try and increase the resilience of this great area to cope with climate change. So I thank you very much. I want to, just before I finish, acknowledge that this work was a huge effort for the agency, but it was a huge effort for a number of other people, including NGOs, scientists, uh, stakeholders, the whole lot. So it was a, a long process, but uh, certainly a worthy outcome. Thank you. We've got time for some questions. If there are questions, if people could come to the two microphones, please, and direct your question to the member of the panel.
Okay, first question here, Rick. community have been two things. One is the fishermen would like to limit the, the fishery, so they're having a limited entry. They voted to do that. That's hopefully going to be approved pretty soon. The other one was to create a species of concern list. About 90% of the species that are not really fish, the footprint would be frozen and they would not be allowed to be collected. And then that re remains a species of about 20 or 30, and those are probably going to have some kind of limits on them eventually. So those, that's the plan right now. And that's just in West Hawaii. The state is also having some increased management as well. We have another question over here. I'll talk. The, the question was, um, did any of the panel have any experience with rotating zones, the opening and closing of zones? If I can give some little uh, uh, experience from the Great Barrier Reef. We've had a number of experiments uh, and scientific um, assessments. Uh, one called Bramble Reef was closed for a number of years and it, during the closure we saw a huge increase in the fish stocks as we'd expect. It, the uh, opening day was announced and uh, within two weeks of the opening day that the biomass on that reef had been fished down to, to below what it was before it was initially closed. The fishers really hammered that area. The commercial guys are very good at it and both between them and the, and the recreational but primarily the commercial knocked that one right down. So that's an example of how you can very quickly decrease the stocks on a reef. We've also had a major um, experiment called the effects of line fishing. Um, again, we, we know that um, reserves put in place, we get increase of uh, fish stocks as, we, as we've heard from some of the other speakers, we get spillover. So there is really no need to have rotation. Rotation may be a, a fisheries management tool, but if we're talking about protecting biodiversity, which was our situation, that's not the sort of tool we use. And we honestly believe, and we've now demonstrated, that some of those fisheries benefits can occur for the areas outside where you can have fishing, the fishing so we don't need to go to rotations for fishing. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah, actually that came up in, in West Hawaii too. They actually, one of the communities wanted an aquarium zone in front of their resort, of their area where they live. And so in exchange for that, they agreed to open up another one. Uh, so there were some surveys done there to get an assessment of the amount of aquarium fish that were there, which is substantial. And the collectors actually agreed to have a lottery where just a couple people would be selected and then to get the fish there every couple years so that it wouldn't get opened completely up. And so that's hopefully going to happen here relatively soon. We have another question here. Yes, uh, oh, it's working. Um, I was just have this question for the um, Florida Keys um, Marine Sanctuary. You mentioned um, climate change and you mentioned bleaching, but I was wondering um, your presentation title included responding to climate change. I was wondering how those MPAs respond to climate change and if those don't, how are you going to respond to climate change? Yeah, my, my title and my abstract were ambitious. They were going to be, I was going to have a whole panel. And, and uh, Nancy very graciously said, well, you can speak, but you have to do it all yourself. 
So I had to sort out some things. But yes, um, the, the concept of resiliency is an, a very important one. It's something that we've been working with the Great Barrier Reef and uh, uh, Paul Marshall and some of uh, the, the staff from the Great Barrier Reef. But the Nature Conservancy has been coordinating a, a huge activity uh, in the Florida Keys, in the southeast Florida area, to identify areas that are more resilient than others. Now, will they always stay resilient? I don't think we know enough about those systems, but we do know that there are some areas that still have very healthy uh, coral communities that we feel that we need to invest more of our management into and really pay attention to some of these areas. And that was where I was hoping to be able to talk about some of the successes there. Um, clearly, there are habitats um, all up, up and down the southeast coast of Florida that are uh, in better shape than what you hear about very often. We have a question down here. Sure. Um, it seems like in the cases that all of you have presented, oops, <laughs> uh, all of you have presented, uh, as well as some of the fisheries uh, pieces earlier, um, even though there are several problems often put up on your first slide, you ultimately talk about, focus in on a specific issue and a clear, you know, act course of action that, that seems to be helpful to resolve that issue. Um, what I've seen in Chesapeake Bay is, is actually because we have sort of an array of different stressors, the various stakeholder groups essentially pointing their finger at each other and, and really becoming hamstrung in terms of even though there is huge, you know, public support for you know, fixing the bay, taking action becomes very difficult because everybody's pointing their finger at each other in terms of what the appropriate action is. And so I'm wondering whether in, in the work that any of you have done, you've run into that and how you resolve that kind of, of conflict. I think we've all run into it, so I'll ask some of my colleagues to talk. Billy, do you want to start? Well, definitely, uh, it, it is something that we've seen a lot of... Uh, uh, we, we've seen that happen, and right now we, we need to be looking forward. You, that one slide I put up about the recreational commercial fishing uh, pressures uh, on the resources in southeast Florida. Uh, clearly, the more we point fingers at each other, we're not going to be able to move forward. We, we really have to get beyond that. A fish on the ice doesn't care how it was caught or how it got there. It's still just as dead as it would be caught by any means. So I really feel that we need to be looking more forward. Brian? Brian? I'll say a few comments. Um, I mean, I, I talked about the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, and I mentioned how quickly that was put in, a relatively large park, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't go in as quickly now. You know, they're, they're expanding their system of marine protected areas, but they're much smaller, and they've taken many, many more years now to, to sort of phase in the next phase. And there is, you know, that kind of finger pointing, you know, the Bahamian, some Bahamian fishermen say it's not us, it's, you know, the, it's the Haitians, you know, or it's the Americans. And, and to some extent that's true, but uh, as, as um, Billy said, um, you know, it's really about coming to some consensus and then enforcement. I mean, many more people are in favor of these marine reserves if they think other people aren't going to be cheating and taking advantage of them. Brian? I think in some ways West Hawaii it had relatively few conflicts, so it was relatively easy. That was one of the secrets of that area. And so some of those that are very complex are just very difficult. And I don't know how much of that you heard. Uh, I think one of the secrets in West Hawaii was really a small fishery with a lot of people, so it was quite simple. And so that was very difficult to resolve as it was. But we did do research on some of the allegations that people had made against each other and showed in some cases those weren't really there. So that, that did help a little bit. Roy? <laughs> this maybe isn't uh, so much marine, but uh, we had these issues with goose management in terms of dealing with the Native American tribes in Alaska and hunters in the lower 48 states pointing at each other on who was the, the, at fault for population declines. And so it took a lot, of, a lot of working with these groups and a lot of understanding, a lot of give and take to get down to the root of the issues and, and develop a plan to 
to restore the uh, resources. We've got some tremendous uh, examples uh, of goose management where that's worked, but it wasn't easy at the start. Yep. Very quickly, I'll, you know, you can measure success scientifically, but a way to get to answer your question, um, I was driving along the US-1 and I was listening to a radio fishing talk show and the host started talking about all the catches of mutton snapper. This was just about eight months ago. And they started interviewing fishermen all up and down the Keys and for two and three years in a row they'd had banner catches of mutton snapper. That, that was that large number I pointed out up there. When they hung up, these two captains, who I know totally opposed the reserves, started taking total credit for them. Now, <laughs> That's when you, you stay quiet, you let it go. That's the synergy that these things get going. So you have to get over some bumps and humps. But clearly, once they start taking credit for them and taking ownership, then you're off and going towards success. Thanks, Billy. I'll take two more questions. John? Uh, yeah, uh, last summer in the, at the International Coral Reef Symposium, Roger Bradbury gave a very provocative talk in which he suggested we're in the first century of the Anthropocene. And that our attempts to manage uh, our natural environment by essentially keeping out those human influences that uh, you guys have been talking about in all your talks are destined to failure. And you can need no look, look no further, perhaps, than in your talk, John, where, where you have this uh, overarching impact of, uh, of climate change. Uh, I'm, I, it's not really a question, but I'd like to hear you comment about, about this. I, I think we're going to hear a lot more about it, frankly, because uh, I, think that, I think there's a certain truth in that our, our management is following down traditional tracks, and we need to get to, to, to rethink it, uh, because things are just coming on so strong. Anyway, I'd be interested in comments if anybody cares. Well, I certainly agree we've got to re rethink some of the way we're doing it, but that doesn't mean we stop uh, you know, continuing with some of the success stories that I think we've heard today. So I, I certainly agree climate change is a huge emerging issue. We've got to certainly think of new ways to address it. But I think the success stories we've seen right throughout today shows that we are doing some great things right around the world. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, you know, MPAs and marine reserves are just one tool within the quiver. And um, there's probably smarter ways to use them. Um, and those are, you know, people are working on those developments to make them better able to, or, or make people better able to identify places where they're going to have the most bang for the buck, for example, in, in terms of providing resilience to climate change. But um, obviously another, a ton of other approaches are necessary and we've got to use everything we can. Really a very quick answer. Just, just as we're seeing these impacts and the people pressures and all the pressures on the resources, we are now, we have the tools available to step back and, and look at it on a broader, more remote scale. I totally agree with you, John, but as a, as a manager, I can't give up. The, the things that I have to do, I get up to go to work in the morning to try, to try to do something about the next problem. We're looking at scales now that we never dreamed of looking at two decades ago, and I think the solutions are going to lie both at that upper end as well as the microbial size of the scale. Nobody Thank wants anybody to give up. That wasn't the point. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't. The point is that I think it's not moving this lockout strategy for human influences on the natural world. And if you think that, Gregory's comment provides a provocative entree to that. Sure. Okay. Thanks, John. I didn't interpret it. The other quick comment is I guess I would disagree with the term lockout. I mean, there's a continuum of uses of marine seascapes and, you know, we're, um, you know, a marine reserve is preventing fishing, but it's not preventing many other uses, for example, ecotourism uses. And I think there's a framing problem, I guess, that I would challenge there. Thanks, Dan. Okay, last question. Yeah, actually, this is for you. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because we have all probably read a lot of the stuff Dan's done on the cascading effects of marine reserves and, and you know, uh, herbivory and things like that, but, but you actually mentioned something and you didn't go into it, and that was the crown of thorns. Um, and you said that the crown of thorns is decreasing in your protected areas. And I'm wondering, um, I mean, there's, there's tremendous implications in that and for habitat and for ecosystem function and a lot of different things. And I'm wondering if uh, you have any information on that or you want to elaborate on that. There's a paper by Hugh Sweetman in um, 
I think it's uh, coral reefs, but anyway, it's certainly on our website it's a reference. But basically, we don't really know why, but we can certainly demonstrate scientifically that since the zoning came in in the green zones, there is a scientifically or statistically reduction, uh, marked reduction in the number of crown of thorns. Not only that, the fact that we've got the network set up the way it is, they're not getting the outbreaks sweeping down through the Great Barrier Reef they have, the way they have in the past. That was some uh, research that was just published 2008. Uh, we obviously need to monitor it. But yeah, we're very excited about it. And as you say, I think it's an, an important part of healthier ecosystems as a result of what we've done in the, in the new no-take zones. I'm wondering if that makes you rethink the idea of um, the coastal influences of uh, Crown of Thorns outbreaks. Absolutely, and, and not just that. But as I said, it's a whole ecosystem-based management approach to, to managing that, that marine environment. Anyway, look, I, I need to cut it there. Thank you very much to the presenters for uh, this afternoon's session. And thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, I have a few uh, announcements, and, and Jeremy and I will make a few final comments. First, actually, uh, before she escapes to do some other urgent task, I'd really like to acknowledge, uh, that, of course, there are many people involved making this meeting work, but the person who really made it happen is Christine Okanga, who I think is still there, and she deserves a huge round of applause. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to ask Ellen uh, to come back up to make sure everyone's really clear about this, the uh, how and where to see Daniel Pauly's talk, which begins at 6, and then Jeremy and I will have a few final comments. Thank you, Nancy. Um, okay. <clears throat> Look at your tag. If you have in the upper left-hand corner a blue highlighted square, it means that you can be in here for Daniel Pauly's talk between 6 and 7. So come back here by 5.45. We'll start at 6 with an introduction by Nancy. If you don't, then please go to the Atrium Cafe just outside for a video cast and join us there. And if you have a blue dot, I didn't think this up, okay? If you have a blue dot on the bottom of your tag, it means you can come to the reception upstairs in the Sand Ocean Hall between 7 and 8.30. If you don't have a blue dot, join us anyway, okay? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, I feel a lot better than I did this morning. I, I think Nancy and I had no idea how this would work out. I, I just wanted to say that although I still have a ponytail and I, I still remember the 60s, I have not um, put on my rose-colored glasses again. Some of you are old enough to remember those. Uh, we really had them. Um, the sky is falling. The world's a mess. Um, there isn't a whole lot of good news, but there is some good news. And I can't imagine being Billy or John, who I think are heroes, um, without um, a little bit of optimism at the beginning of the day. And the only way you can, you can fuel that optimism is to have a little bit of objectivity and, and ask yourself on a regular basis whether or not there is good news, whether there are things that we can do and, and that they might make a difference. And I would like to say that I think what we've we've seen today are some really very clear examples of, of a reason to have some hope. Um, uh, we're not Panglossian, but um, without some sense of hope, why should we try? I, I hope this may have helped a little bit to encourage you, especially the younger people, to uh, not give up and tilt at a few more windmills and, and someday we'll get there. Thanks for coming.